Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to what is, of course, going to be a festive and wonderful night, seeing Handel's Messiah. Thank you for the warm applause. <laughs> Even though you didn't really know what we were going to be doing. My name is Amy Faust, and I am here representing All Classical Portland, which I assume many of you are familiar with, the radio station. Thank you. It's a great station, and I'm so, so happy to work there. And if you're here for Messiah tonight, and if you are a fan of Messiah, then I imagine you may listen to All Classical from time to time. But I want to remind you that we have so much happening during the holiday season. We have the Festival of Carols that actually starts on the 22nd. And that is four days of just nonstop joyous holiday music that we would love for you to tune in. We would love for that to be the soundtrack for your season on All Classical Portland. Um, I've been working there for about a year and a half. And has anyone ever heard On Deck with Young Musicians? Yay! It's such a great idea to talk, to check in with the young musicians in this community, and that's what I do. So you'll hear my work from time to time on On Deck with Young Musicians. And it's really a thrill to talk to these, these kids who are so motivated and so talented. Um, so what a great job to be able to do that from time to time. Um, before that, I worked in country radio for 20 years. And I tell you that because I'm relatively new compared to the, the, the people here on either side of me. I'm relatively new to the world of classical music. So if I say anything that doesn't make sense, I hope someone will just yell out. <laughs> Either one of you are also just welcome, welcome to, you know, anything you want to want to do to uh, to set me straight i appreciate but i'm a big i'm a i'm an enthusiastic fan and tonight i am joined by elizabeth schwartz now you might not know this yet but you own her work and that is because in your hand you have a program and she is an annotator which means that she writes the notes in the program and if you don't read the notes you're really missing out because she puts a lot of work into that and we'll talk about that she puts a lot of work into creating a story for you to really make sure that you're experiencing uh, the music to its fullest and getting the backstory and all kinds of interesting details. I loved reading your notes, so thank you. Well, thank you. And this is Ethan Sperry. And Ethan will be directing the choir tonight. And so he's only with us for the 15 minutes, the first 15 minutes of this half hour conversation because then he will be running backstage to warm up the choir for you. So I'm gonna start with Ethan and then we'll move over to Elizabeth, but pipe in any time you feel like chatting or adding anything. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a dangerous thing to ask. Um, so Ethan, now Ethan is with PSU and I wanna make sure I get your, your title correct. You are? I am the Barry Stoll Professor of Choral Music at Portland State University and the head of our choral program. There you go. And beyond that, choirs under Ethan's direction have actually toured over 20 foreign countries and sung at the Hollywood Bowl, the Kennedy Center, and the United Nations, among other places, as well as this fabulous Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall. So tonight, obviously, he will be directing his highly acclaimed chamber choir, and he's just gonna join us for a few minutes until he has to warm up the choir. So I, my first question will be, as soon as you run off the stage, what will be the first thing that you do with the singers? Well, fortunately for me, I have a number of grad students in the choir, so they've, or they're already starting a, the warm-up process for me, and we have a lot of notes. We had our dress rehearsal this morning. It's quite a tiring thing to sing the Messiah twice in one day, once in the morning and, and then once again in the evening. But uh, I have a list of notes, and uh, the trickiest one was the uh, movement number 30, Lift Up Your Heads, O Ye E Gates. And uh, David changed both the tempo and the way he wanted it articulated, so we need to go back uh, over that. Um, I should make it clear, my job is actually done once they go on stage. I actually get to sit in the audience and enjoy the piece with you, and it's sort of like being the director of a play. You just sit back there and pray that everything's going to be going okay. Uh, but I leave all the conducting uh, up to David. 
And I've had the, the pleasure to sing the Messiah many times and to pre prepare it twice for the Oregon Symphony. And these have been my two favorite performances with Carlos Kalmar four years ago and with David. I'm going to be honest, I'm not a Messiah fan. I like every individual movement, but I think a lot of Handel sounds very similar to itself. And by the time we get to movement number 30, I'm kind of wishing I had left it in permission. <laughs> But you're not, done. You're over it by 30. But not with this orchestra. Both Carlos and David have found so much variety in this piece, and they make every movement sound different. And they do it by reading the words and really bringing the text to life. And I find that ironic because neither Carlos Calamar nor David has, uh, Donsmeyer has English as a first language. Yet I find they have deeper insights into the English and how Handel set it to music uh, than many of the, the English-speaking conductors that I've worked with. And um, it, we're just so gifted to have, mus or, or so blessed to have musicians of their stature in charge of, of this orchestra. Uh, you're in for a really, really exciting messiah. So to, you mentioned David Donsmeyer. So tell us a little bit more since he's obviously new this season and you here in the, the audience have probably experienced so far, I'm hoping have experienced his work so far. Um, he's brand new. Tell me your impressions and what, what you really enjoy about working with him. Uh, he's really fantastic. It's given me a little bit of an, an ego check. He's the first, uh, or I've prepared choirs for a lot of orchestral conductors, but he's the first one that's younger than me. <laughs> and that can be a little hard, but it, it's not. He's, he's exquisite. He's fantastic with the students. The rehearsal on Wednesday that he did with them, just with this, my students and the pianist, uh, was one of the best rehearsals I've ever been at. It's highly demanding, but really positive, reinforcing, engaging, everything you could hope for, for somebody who's used to working with professionals who then comes in to run a, a, a student rehearsal, but he brought it to such a high level. He actually scanned his orchestral score where he had marked like every phrase of the piece, where he wanted crescendos, diminuendos, what dynamic, where the stressed syllables were, where the weak syllables were, where to put the consonants. I mean, he sent all of that information to us so that we literally had all of that uh, in our hands, and then he's a great musician. Even though that's what he thought he wanted when he scanned his score a couple months ago, he changes his mind on the fly. So he's really giving the students a full, like, this is what it's like to play at the professional level, is to be able to make these minute adjustments just at the moment. And uh, it's a real joy working with him. I'm so glad he's our new music director. I think he's, he's wonderful in every way. And we think of something like uh, Messiah as being something, well, that is all written in stone, and it's you do it this way, and that's how you do it. But as I understand it, it's not really that way. There isn't a lot of direction given by Handel. It's not, it's not the same as other pieces. So there is actually a certain amount of interpretation that goes into it. So you're saying he's actually throwing a lot of that in there. Right. One of the dangers about performing Baroque music is at least when, when I was a younger musician, I don't think we understood this as well, but the way music notes are written has evolved over time. And over time, composers have put more and more markings into their music. So quarter notes, eighth notes, you know, all the beaming, the rhythms, the pitches, the clefs, key signatures, all of that existed, but the metronome didn't exist. So Handel didn't put in exact markings for speed. He put in more general guidelines, works, words like allegro or andante that give you a lot more wiggle room than saying the quarter note is 96, where, you know, click, click, click. Also, composers like Handel tended to write one dynamic at the beginning of a movement and then trust that the musicians would play it musically, that they would understand how to shape the phrases. But I, when I was a younger musician, I was told that meant, nope, you just got to play it all piano. And that led to very boring performances of the Messiah or other works by Handel where you just sort of be monochromatic. And because those other choices aren't in there, the conductor or the performers have so many choices about where they want a crescendo and diminuendo. And you'll see that David is asking for very dramatic changes and very interesting shapes of phrases and changing movement to movement. And it's been a really cool process to watch what he wants versus other people that I've worked with. Um, I think the, the current vogue is how fast can we possibly do this? <laughs> and there are two movements with where David is doing that, and it is scary. The <laughs> students like are a, terrified, like a... but fortunately we're wearing masks, so you can't really tell. <laughs> uh, but we've worked to, to get it up to the speed that he wants, but he's also allowing some pieces to be slow and to really give us a lot of different character instead of just being virtuosic. So here's a question. Is there a hierarchy? Like, if he comes in and says, I want this, this, and that, you say, yes, that's how we will do it. Or do you say... No, David, I actually think it should be this, this, and that. Is there any pushback? 
no, that's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if there's enough time, we do like discussing these kinds of things, and I've brought up some of those kinds of ideas, but really I think my job is to provide the interpretation that he wants, and that's actually the job of everybody on the stage. The, the whole reason for conductors is that if everyone here were allowed to play the piece their own way, we would get chaos, even though all the musicians on the stage are very accomplished, and they could all come up with a great interpretation. Someone's got to pull it all together and get us all to do it the same way. The only place I really could step in is if I had to say, you know, I don't think we can actually sing it that fast, or mm -hmm. singing it this slow is going to make it really hard for us to... I mean, if I brought up a technical challenge that's out of our capabilities. But uh, for the students, uh, they, they really love him too. And when David decided to go faster, they're like, we are going to do this. So, and it was great. I attached a, a metronome to, uh, in my phone to the speakers in the choir room. And it was going bang, 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 out of, oh, sorry, bang, 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 because it was really fast, uh, out of the speakers in the choir room for us to make sure we could do it at his speed. So the speed sounds like something that, do you think it's enough of a difference that the audience tonight is going to say, whoa, slow down, this is crazy. Or do you think it's, it, or is it more subtle than that? You'll know. <laughs> that is exciting. Is there anything else that you would want to tell the audience? Um, you're going to notice this, like this is a thing that, that David came in and said, this is what I want to do. And it's a really specific moment that maybe surprised you. Maybe, but I'm not sure I want to give away the surprise. Oh, so no, but these are the surprise. people that came earlier, so because they yeah, wanted yeah. extra information. Yeah, give them a spoiler, so they'll they'll be clued in. One of the uh, well, there's there's two things that that David is doing that I find uh, really special. Uh, the first one is that he begins the Hallelujah chorus quite soft, and most people just blast their way through that entire piece, and uh, that's not actually what Handel wrote in his score. That it's supposed to start as like this vision and then it grows and grows, and then there's one section in the piece where we sing, uh, and I'm Jewish, so, but this is a Christian piece. It says, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And you actually hear in the music a transformation from soft to loud, that the moment that the kingdom of the wor this world becomes heaven, you hear that in the music, and then it becomes loud and triumphant and everything like that, and it's really exciting to experience that transformation that Handel wrote in the music, but most conductors leave out. They just play the whole thing loud. And then I just talked about all the variety that he does. At the very end of the piece, Handel writes his most complicated fugue on just the word amen. And it's, it's a very, very hard piece to sing. And it's the only time Handel is famous for his canons where you hear one part come in on a melody and then the next part gets a turn and then the next part. And this is one of the only movements where he overlaps the melody, where everybody's singing at the same time. And sometimes some parts are singing the melody right side up and some of them are singing it upside down. And it's, it's incredibly complicated writing. And this is the one place where David has asked for no dynamic change. First, we just sing everything completely piano and then everything completely forte as if like all the shaping, everything, I'm done now, just amen, so be it. It's soft, and then it's loud, and then everything you need to hear all the moving parts is actually in the music. You don't, the performers don't need to bring anything to it. But after so much shaping and after so much contrast, that choice to just have this blanket ending is, is quite stunning. So those might be two of the places that I would listen for. That's fantastic. That's going to make it so much more interesting when we get to that point. Now, tell us a little bit about the singers that we'll be seeing tonight. Uh, how long, I'm, I'm imagining for some of them, this is the first time they've ever performed this. And I know that you're kind of known for more contemporary uh, works and performing those in international uh, works. And so for your singers, what made this different and what was exciting about it and what was challenging about it? Yeah. Uh I think there are, you're going to see 42 singers on stage tonight, and I think five of them have sung The Messiah before. So wow. for 37 of them, it's going to be their first time singing the piece, and it's going to be hard to top this. So <laughs> clap of the level extra of orchestra hard for them, knowing that it's their first yeah. time. Um, and those singers were also on stage for Mahler 2 at the beginning of this season, and we had another concert in between. So in the past, uh, this is the end of our 12th week of rehearsal for this year, and the Messiah is for them probably three times as much music as we normally learn in a 10-week quarter. There's just so many notes. And to come out of COVID and have to learn that and Mahler and another concert, it means these students have learned, have worked really hard. They've learned four times as much music in this quarter as they would normally do. 
Uh, and at a time where we're sort of not used to working that hard, and you can judge for yourself, but I, am, I have never been prouder of a group of students and how positively they've responded to that challenge. It's like, yes, we were silent for a long time, now let's just do this. Let's do Mahler, let's do our own stuff, and let's do the Messiah, and let's really, and you can see it, they're marking their scores. We have a, a channel on this uh, application called Slack. They're sending comments to each other about how we can all do better. It's, it's really exciting, but it is a lot of work, and I think that's what it takes to be a classical musician. And in college, very often with our, our music majors, we'll be like, oh, you get to sing these two songs at the end of the semester for your faculty, and that's what you're going to be graded on. And then you get into the real world, and you realize how much music you need to learn every week to make a living. And, and so th this is a fantastic, not just musical experience, performances with the symphony, but it's a real education in what it might mean at that next step. Um, but of the students you're going to see on stage, uh, six of them are graduate students in conducting, uh, meaning that they, they want to be choir directors uh, when they graduate, and all the others are undergraduates. And some of them are uh, voice performance, probably about 10 of them. 20 are music education majors, meaning they want to be school music teachers, elementary, middle school, or high school uh, vocal music teachers. And then I think we have just four who are not music majors. Uh, in the choir, and yet are doing this on top of their other uh, studies as well. So that's sort of the makeup of the group. There's only one freshman in the group, uh, and then a few sophomores, and then a lot of juniors and seniors, uh, which is pretty typical. We have seven choirs at Portland State right now, and so this is the most uh, heavily auditioned and the group that works the hardest and is getting these kinds of real professional experiences uh, while they're still in school. And if you need to make some summer plans, uh, we are going to be representing the United States of America at the World Choral Exposition in Portugal this summer, which Yay. is celebrating the uh, 40th anniversary of the founding of the Inter International Federation on Choral Music. So if you need somewhere to go for Labor Day, I suggest you go to Portugal. <laughs> And, and you can hear us uh, singing with 11 different choirs from 11, 11 different countries in uh, all over uh, the area. And that should be a lot of fun. That sounds fantastic. And I love the way you describe how there's almost like a pent-up excitement for performing this fall. And what better way to uh, celebrate than with the Hallelujah Chorus? I mean, I exactly. think there's going to be some true feelings. And for the audience as well, finally being able to be sitting in a seat at the Schnitzer and watching a live performance. And I know that also another thing that Messiah is known for is sort of these moods, real quick mood changes. Uh, how, how have you prepared them for that? I'm sure they're locked and loaded and ready to go, but are, how have you prepared those? That's the easy part. The preparation for changing moods is watch David Donsmeyer. <laughs> Because <laughs> you see everything you need, even with his mask on. It's, it's so intense. Uh, this is not a person who does anything halfway. He just throws himself at the music. Uh, even in rehearsal, even when the orchestra wasn't there. And it, it's just such a joy to work with somebody like that. So uh, thanks so much for listen to, listening to me babble at you for a little while. Enjoy the concert and uh, hope we'll see you at some future shows. Well, enjoy and I'm sorry the. You're part of it. I want to hear everything you had to say. She's she's up next, and enjoy watching the show. Since, as you said, you're just going to be right there watching, like everybody else. Yeah, I think in that corner, so I can get oh. down for my curtain call. <laughs> okay, so. we'll wave to you up there. Thank you so much, Ethan Sperry, for all your hard work in making this happen tonight. That was a great chat. I learned a ton. And it really makes it more exciting to think of what we're going to be seeing tonight, all the work that went into it and all the different... Uh... I was just thinking about that myself. You, Ethan mentioned that he was, uh, that there was one freshman in his chamber choir. Um, when I was a freshman in college, that was me. And my freshman year, we also did Messiah with our chamber choir, 24 voices, six on a part, no dead wood. <laughs> Everybody's voice mattered. And we did a Baroque Messiah with a Baroque orchestra, professional soloists. And so that was my very first major musical experience. So I have a very long history with this piece uh, as a singer and later as a historian. Um, and I just, as it happens, I happened, I was in Chicago last weekend celebrating Thanksgiving with my family and we went to hear a Baroque Messiah. <laughs> so I'm all primed and ready to go. You are I indeed. I as am. well as if you're just joining us, this is uh, Elizabeth Schwartz and she actually is a full-time annotator, which means that her job is to write those notes that you have in your program. Uh, so that is not just something you jot off the top of your head. There is, is a lot not. of, there's a lot that goes into that. I mean, I, I read it and I, I got so much out of it and I hope that, of course, you all will read it as well. I am, I'm not gonna actually talk 
about what's in the notes because that's encouragement to read them. Um, and I, there's so much more to say. Um, one of my major complaints always as an annotator is give me more room, please. Right. And at least in this program, there's only one piece to write about. So I get more space to write and really go into depth. But again, there's always more and more to say about it. Um, gosh. So, so being a program annotator, I guess I could just start with that. It's, uh, it's a very niche kind of a job. In fact, many years ago, uh, my wife was a co-owner at a local bike shop and she was describing to her co-workers and co-owners what I did. And one of them sort of looked at her and said, that's a job? <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> yes it is. Um, although I do have, I do have the unique um, situation in which there are program annotators who do it for free. Uh, when you have small ensembles on shoestring budgets, sometimes a member of the board who's musically knowledgeable will write notes. Sometimes the conductor wants to write the notes. Uh, you know, it just depends. But I write notes for the Oregon Symphony and I have uh, about nine or 10 other clients currently right now. I write for ensembles around the country and also locally, Chamber Music Northwest. Um, and it's, it's great fun. And I, I'm doing it full time now, but um, most annotators don't do this full time. In fact, I only know of one other person who does it full time and I think he's close to retirement. So I might be the only one. Wow. I meant to ask you, and this is just a general question, how many times do you think you've seen Handel's Messiah? Seen it? Fewer times than I've performed it, definitely. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, yeah. so be, yeah. you've been in it more times than yes. you've seen it. Yes. Okay, so total number for both, what would you say? Oh, gosh. Um, well, oh, a couple dozen, maybe. Couple dozen. Yeah. Now I wanted to ask. That's over, you know, thirty plus years. My right, that's right. Not like every weekend. Of the, you know, <laughs> that would be a bit much. So, so I also wanted to ask the audience because I'm curious. First, let's start with this. Is there anyone here? And I doubt it. Is there anyone here tonight who has never seen Handel's Messiah? <gasps> That is oh, so great. exciting. That is exciting. Yeah. So you definitely need to read Elizabeth's notes because you'll <laughs> get the whole story. It's such a fascinating story, uh, how, it, how it came about and how it's evolved and um, the, just how quickly he wrote it. Yeah, it's interesting. Handel wrote Messiah in a three-week span. And as Ethan mentioned earlier, there are 30 movements. And uh, that's a lot of music to write in three weeks. Uh, and we're talking including scoring, orchestration, you know, the whole bit. And myths and um, legends popped up about this seemingly miraculous speed with which uh, Handel worked, that he was caught in a white hot religious fervor. And there was, you know, there were, there, there were etchings and woodblock prints of him, you know, gazing raptly and, you know, or, or, you know, being inspired or whatever. And in fact, Handel often wrote quickly. It was not a, not a, uh, a unique thing for him to turn out a piece this quickly. He wrote in the summers, like a lot of, a lot of composers, he was also a conductor, uh, like Mahler, for example, who wrote most of his music during the summers uh, in between concert seasons. And he had to get stuff ready because, you know, the theater was gonna open in September and, you know, the, the, the singers and the orchestra had, had to rehearse. So he was on deadline, um, just like, all of us who, mm -hmm. who, work, who work toward a deadline. And so, in fact, it was not that he was caught in some white hot religious <laughs> um, He, I believe, I think he was a believer. I don't think he was a particularly fervent believer, um, but people's relationship with the text of Messiah, uh, the libretto was, was put together by a man named Charles Jennings, who was quite religious and, and very fervent. Um, and he was very skillful in the way he chose the texts and the way he arranged them to tell, tell the story. Um, it's, it's very interesting in that he created a drama that happens to be about Jesus. And um, Jesus' name is almost never mentioned. The word Christ comes up in the Hallelujah Chorus, but other than that, you don't hear the word Jesus or the words Jesus. So you could think of this uh, Messiah as being, it's not the Messiah, it's simply Messiah. So mm. it has a more of a universal um, 
application to it, which is an interesting thing to contemplate. Um, but people had a different relationship with the Bible in, in Handel's time than they do now. Most people read a verse every night before they went to sleep. Uh, Bible verses were often quoted in conversation. It was, you know, it, and, and this was not because people were overly religious necessarily. It was just, it was the text of the times, basically. There was less competition. It was, a, it, no, I <laughs> well, mean, it, it was a big, but. But, right, but it was a big part of everyone's sure. daily life. And yeah. there was there was not a lot of noise to, to compete with that. No, and, and Jennings chose his text knowing full well that many of them would be instantly recognizable to people um, as part of their daily Bible reading, uh, as part of their weekly church going. And so there was an intimacy and a familiarity with the text right away um, that, that I think helped people to connect with this piece. Uh, I and loved, that's independent of the music, which is a whole other area. And I loved what you said in the notes about how for people of that time, the words in this piece that you're going to be seeing tonight were so familiar that it was almost like what the most uh, equivalent thing now would be a bunch of jingles or slogans, like yeah. just do it. Yeah. You know, it was stuff that they were hearing constantly. It wasn't a new, it wasn't a new, um, it wasn't new input for them. It also, because the, these phrases were in constant usage, there was a, there was a, an everydayness about them. This was not a, an exalted tale. This was not some otherworldly um, narrative. You know, this was a story they all knew, and this was a story told in phrases and verses that they all knew extremely well. And so there was, there was a, this instant sense of, oh, I know how this goes. Mm -hmm. And, and that, was, that was really, I think, again, helped to, helped to make people connect with it quickly. I wonder if there is anything else you could tell us to put us in the mindset of what it would have been like to witness Messiah in the 17 or the right. 1800s. I mean, we can already now imagine that this was a familiar to them, but is there anything else that can sort of put us in that Gosh. in place? Um, well, handle, I am, I, I am actually gonna break my promise of not talking about the notes because I'm gonna talk <laughs> about something that's in the notes very briefly. Um, Handel had to pivot away from his former bread and butter which was writing opera seria. And opera seria was old style opera that was based on usually Greek characters out of mythology. And um, by the 1740s, this style of opera was falling out of fashion and fewer and fewer people were coming. Handel uh, had a couple of different opera companies that had failed financially. And he, he saw the writing on the wall and he said, well, I gotta give the people what they want. And so he decided to stop writing opera altogether and in fact he uh, uh, he did um, and concentrated solely on oratorios and Messiah is only his fa most famous oratorio but there are many many others that are also still performed today one that you might be familiar with is uh, Julius Caesar um, and uh, Judas Maccabeus um, and gosh I can't even think of all the others but there are many um, Messiah is just the most popular <laughs> Um, but they're all very good. So I see from our trusty stage hands that we may be coming to the end of our time. Uh, yeah, any more time or do we have to leave? <laughs> so be sure to read Elizabeth Schwartz's notes because also she explains some really interesting uh, moments that you can pay attention to where a word, like such as the word astray, and if you've seen Messiah before, you might know this, but the word astray, it's almost like wordplay. where It, it's, it it's, is wordplay. Where yes, yeah. he'll take a word like astray and he'll put a bunch of notes on it that kind of go astray. So there are a lot of moments like that that she points out yeah. in the program that will help you appreciate this sort of the, the, all the cleverness of yeah. this piece as well as the beauty of this piece. So thank you for everything that you've written. You're welcome. Um, and be sure and read that. And thanks for joining <laughs> us. And then I did ask if anyone has never seen it. Now I want to ask, raise your hand if you've seen the Messiah five times. Nice. Okay, keep your hand up. Uh, raise your, keep your hand up if you've seen it 10 times. Okay, let's go for 15. I'm actually trained as an auctioneer, so all of a sudden I feel like I'm auctioneering. <laughs> 15, we have this person right over, two people right over here have seen it 15 times. So can you shout out how many times you actually think you've seen it? 30, wow. 
32. 32. Goodness. That is amazing. Well, is tonight your 33rd? Lucky 33. 